Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Is the audio okay? Okay, maybe we can start now. Okay. Let me share the uh, PowerPoint screen. Okay, can you all can you all see the PowerPoint presentation? Okay, it's working. Okay. Okay, let me turn on the PowerPoint show. Okay, shall we start now? It's okay. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our podcast. I don't know whether we call it podcast or broadcast. At this uh, during this special period, uh, hope everyone is doing well at home safely. Okay, so for today, uh, I'll take some time to share with you some of the latest developments that we have been observing about how we can use AI to fight COVID nineteen, or how AI can help us in various uh, aspects in terms of uh, our combat with COVID nineteen. Okay. Okay, before we go into details of the AI technology, let me just uh, uh, share with you some key concepts that uh, is being involved in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, okay? So when we talk about COVID-19, we are actually referring to the uh, uh, disease that the virus is causing. Actually, the virus is called the SARS-CoV-2, it's a severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus version two. So it's an RNA virus. Later on, we'll see how we can make use of this information to design AI defenses, okay? So the, the disease is causing in your body, it's actually mainly affects your lung. We call it COVID-19, coronavirus disease 2019, okay? Currently, this disease has made the significant negative impact on our society in terms of the uh, strains on our healthcare systems as well as on our economy. Okay, so it's quite a challenge to us. So far, uh, when we try to summarize the involvement of AI technologies uh, uh, to, uh, against COVID-19, I uh, did a little classification of the categories of technologies available currently. So uh, I, I selected some works that has been uh, used in hospitals, which are our first line of defense against COVID-19. Some other uh, applications are emerging in the economic arena, which is uh, our second line of defense. Sorry, there's a typo on my slides. I meant to say this is our sec second line of defense and in terms of uh, making sure that our economic life is uh, uh, being affected as uh, uh, the, the, the effect on our economic life is being mitigated as much as possible, okay? Uh, is the third part is in terms of in the labs, okay? How AI can help us design treatments in the labs. So this is an area where we can mount our counter strike against the COVID-19 disease, okay? So let's see some examples, okay? So in hospitals, uh, the application I have selected uh, in hospitals is about healthcare robots, okay? So uh, with the COVID-19, we can see that a, a lot of uh, severely affected areas, they have their hospital, they have their healthcare institutions severely uh, overwhelmed by COVID-19, okay? We have a lot of uh, situations where we are short of staff, we are short of, uh, uh, they, they are overworked, okay? They, which affects how they deliver care to the patients. And also there is a shortage of protection equipment from time to time uh, at uh, different locations, okay? So we want, to, what we want to see, is there any way that AI can help us to alleviate the, mainly the resource shortage in the hospitals, okay? So I want to highlight the work that uh, uh, I know of, which is uh, uh, with our collaborator from Shandong University in China, which is the worst affected, one of the worst affected areas uh, by COVID-19. And they are the 
also among the first to start to think about how they can fight back against the disease. Okay? So in this uh, joint uh, Shandong University and NTU Research Center for AI, uh, we are developing some solutions involving healthcare robots. Okay? This research center has been started last year in July. Okay? It's a collaboration between Shandong University and NTU Okay, we're, uh, from the very beginning, the focus of the research here is how AI can help with the various aspects of urban life. Okay. Okay, let me go through, okay. Okay, so th these are the healthcare robots that they have developed so far, okay. Originally, there are a lot of technologies already under, uh, undergoing development before the onset of the disease. So in this case, the, once the, once the uh, COVID-19 disease is breaking out, they are quick to put together existing solutions to try to develop uh, robot, robots that can help with the uh, hospital works. Okay? So you can see uh, this is a collaboration with the uh, a lot of frontline professionals actually fighting COVID-19. So they try to understand what they really need and try to package the features into uh, two variants of robots they deliver so far, okay? The first one is about monitoring and delivery robot, which performed key roles such as assisting doctors and nurses to conduct remote consultation with the patients. So they have a small screen and the speakers and the cameras are mounted on it. So they can be moved into quarantine zones in order to have uh, remote sessions between the doctors and patients, so as to minimum to to, to minimize the uh, needs for the doctors and nurses to access these areas. Also, that can, which can which can help with the uh, saving uh, the much needed resources required, okay. and also they can reduce the staff workload and the chance of infection. There's another variant of the robot which are being packaged with uh, different uh, solutions. Okay? Some of the uh, uh, solutions involve the, uh, the quarantine assistant robot that can provide remote computer vision based temperature measurement and patrol given routes with uh, intelligent obstacle avoidance and route planning so that they can help with spraying disinfectants in hospitals. Okay? They can also use the computer vision based uh, technologies to perform uh, facial analytics, to provide audio prompts uh, for people to wear masks effectively. Okay? So, so these are some uh, robotic solutions that we have heard about that's being deployed in the hospitals. Okay? So far, they have delivered seven prototypes to uh, Hubei province uh, in early March 2020, uh, 2020 which, is the, uh, which is one of the uh, hotspots for the disease, okay. Uh, they are the first to deliver these devices into the hospitals, okay. Currently, two of the hospitals are using these devices to help with their healthcare professionals, okay. Okay, moving on. In the economic arena, we have several examples, okay. The first one, we want to talk about the federated learning-based credit, credit risk control under the COVID-19 new normal, okay? So as the disease is progressing, uh, we, a lot of uh, cities are experiencing shutdowns, uh, business activities are affected, and this is uh, resulting in a lot of uh, small and medium enterprises being hit very hard with this uh, situation, okay? And uh, once they start to experience financial difficulties, systemic risk in the banking sector will also emerge, okay? So we are looking at problems uh, about how banks can find ways to collaboratively build updated credit risk control models under this new normal in order to respond to this changing situation to help them control the risks in order to pre prevent a total collapse of the banking system, okay? So in this case, there are actually a lot of uh, data in different banks. They are in, in data silos. Banks, uh, naturally they are very protective about the, their own data sets. A lot of privacy preserving considerations are 
involved. A lot of legal constraints are involved, so they cannot really share data easily. But uh, in order to mount a, a defense against the COVID-19 situation, all the, a lot of the banks would have to come together to share their data in some ways in order to build updated models for risk control. Okay? So here I would like to share with you uh, work with, from our collaborator, WeBank, which is a very unique financial institute in China. It's a fully online bank with uh, no uh, brick and mortar uh, bank branches. So they mostly focus on online banking uh, with, the, uh, with the help of uh, social media data as well. Okay. So the AI department of WeBank, they have uh, been spearheading this new technology called federated learning, which is a new paradigm of machine learning uh, under the uh, artificial intelligence field. So you can see here, uh, it actually provides a way for different institutions or individuals to uh, so-called share their data, but never expose their sensitive data in reality. What they do is actually moving the training of model into different uh, data owners machines. So that the training would happen at where the data are. And uh, after training is done, they follow secure protocols to transfer back the trained models to the central aggregate, aggregator to combine them together into a federated machine learning model, which theoretically can achieve equivalent performance as if all the data are being transferred into a central location for training. Okay? So this kind of technology has been used by WeBank to design uh, a small and medium enterprise credit risk analytics tools to help financial institutions control their risk with regard to this special group of uh, businesses which are hard hit by the coronavirus situation. Okay, you can see the model they have built have been shown to achieve significantly improved uh, accuracy in terms of predicting uh, credit risk compared to the situation where each individual bank would just use their own data to train a model and try to make the predictions. Okay? So this actually can help uh, the entire banking, uh, uh, the entire financial in industry to find a way to control, to mitigate the risk uh, as a result of COVID-19, okay? Uh, recently, we, uh, we have uh, uh, actually published uh, two books on federated learning. So these are the first English book and the first Chinese book on this topic. So if you are interested, you can find out more information about this new paradigm of machine learning that can uh, gain trust from the users through privacy by design, okay? Another example in the economic arena involves uh, satellite imaging analytics to support economic activity recovery, okay? So this one is also from uh, uh, our collaborator in WeBank, okay? Uh, so, so after the initial lockdown, so China now is starting to restart its economic engines, okay? Uh, actually, the COVID-19, they caused tremendous shock to a lot of uh, economic recovery, uh, economic activities, and the recovery process is uneven. And uh, a lot of the traditional indicators, such as CPI, uh, PMI, and interest rates, they are not really updated uh, in real time. And it's very difficult in this situation when everything has changed to make predictions or estimates as to to what extent the economic recover, uh, economic activities has recovered. So we need to find some new ways to enable governments to keep a tap on the pulse of economy uh, almost in real time. Okay. So in this case, the AI department of WeBank is leveraging satellite imaging technology to provide an alternative. Uh, uh, set of indicators to help the government find ways to uh, monitor economic activities. So you can see uh, satellite imaging, they can come in uh, in a lot of different ways. Okay? Some are uh, visual data, some are infrared data, some are from other spectrum of, of uh, sensing. Okay? Uh, 
the Moonshot project is the this is the name of the platform uh, WeBank AI department has developed. It uh, like it uh, combines uh, deep learning. Or it, they combine various uh, techniques from deep learning to form a solution that can use the spatial spatial temporal data from satellite imaging uh, in key areas of China to produce uh, economic indicators, alternative ec economic indicators to uh, analyze to what extent economic activities are restarting. Okay? Here is one example. Here is a small area uh, from the satellite imaging analytics. So this is a, a image of Baogang, which is a steel mill in China. So by comparing the uh, satellite image as of the end of uh, December 2019 uh, uh, to the end of January 2020, because Intuitively, we can see some difference in these uh, 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 images. Though those red spots would represent hot spots as a result of uh, 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 refining activities in the steel mill. By converting the differences between these images that are taken uh, over similar areas over different periods of time, uh, WeBank is actually developing uh, deep learning based segmentation models to predict the change in production of Baogang. Uh, their, estimation, their estimation is that the activity has been reduced by 30% uh, around that number, which is uh, later confirmed to be quite accurate. Okay? So this kind of uh, uh, technology can be easily scaled up to provide large scale and real time tracking of uh, multiple industry production situations as the pandemic evolves. So this is quite a handy tool for governments to keep a tab on uh, the economic act activities over a large area. Okay? Uh, the last project I want to mention in the economic arena is a multi-agent testbed for COVID-19 in ride sharing applications. Okay? So this is a project that uh, I have been working on with our collaborators from the uh, Alibaba City Brain uh, city brain project, okay, which is focused on various uh, aspects of urban life. Okay. So in this case, uh, uh, ride sharing, uh, you should have already some idea of what, what ride sharing is. If I mentioned uh, Uber or Grab, you would uh, intuitively understand what uh, uh, ride sharing applications are referring to. Okay. So these kind of platforms, they already have some AI te technologies involved when they are trying to match your orders. That's already on the road. They want to make an optimization of how to match these uh, uh, orders with the, with the fleets. Okay? Uh, but actually from the reports coming, coming back from Korea and other parts of the world, we can see that the, uh, ride sharing systems, they, they are actually uh, uh, an, quite a confined environment where the passengers and the drivers, they, are, they stay together in close proximity. So they, 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 they can be a channel through which COVID-19 can spread. Okay? So we want to see how we can analyze this situation with the, with the help of AI and see how we can find solutions to adapt to this uh, new situation where, where we still want to keep operating under this new normal okay, with the COVID-19. So this is, a, uh, this is a joint work with the Alibaba NTU Singapore Research, Joint Research Institute, Institute on AI. Okay? So we are developing an AI empowered test bed that can allow us to simulate various conditions. So in this diagram, you can see that we can simulate certain regions in a given city, the movements of the drivers and the passengers. And we also incorporate the order dispatch algorithm as being used into this situation to simulate with high fidelity as if things are happening in the real world. And then in this case, we can inject the infected population uh, under various configurations and, and also put in different policies for the drivers to respond to. And uh, uh, this is a screen capture of the actual demo. The link 
of a YouTube demo video is below. So we can simulate the trajectory of movement of the customers and the drivers. The uh, drivers means the cars. Okay? We can simulate with high fidelity the order dispatch as if it is the real situation. Uh, we, can, we can also put in interaction models within the confined environment to, uh, in terms of where the passengers and drivers are seated. And the, if one of them is not wearing mask or both are wearing mask or multiple of them are uh, wearing in different configurations, okay? we can also allow uh, the adjustment of disease characteristics in the modeling, because uh, as time passed by, we gain new understanding of COVID-19, uh, how they transmit, what kind of uh, impact they can have on your health, whether they are asymptomatic uh, uh, carriers. So these are things that we are discovering as time goes by. And also mo model the psychological distress as uh, the situation develops among the customers and the drivers to see how they can react. And we can also incorporate, extend the platform to incorporate actionable explanation, which is a kind of ex explainable AI that is trying to help us identify you know, why certain subgroups of uh, the population is doing better than the others. So through this uh, technology, it can potentially help policymakers to identify uh, cost-effective solutions that can be effective uh, to prevent the spread of the disease in this uh, area, while also enabling the ride-sharing systems to be uh, in business efficiently. Okay, so this is uh, this work. Okay, finally we move on to the uh, labs. You can see how uh, AI is helping us in the labs. Okay, here we want to mention how we can combine human and the machine intelligence to help us find treatments for COVID-19, okay? Okay, so in order to beat this disease, we need effective drugs, we need vaccines. Uh, however, the development of new treatment at the molecular level, they're very time consuming and complex in the labs, okay? Is it because uh, for, uh, for RNAs as, uh, and also if we want to design solutions involving proteins, the search space of uh, valid structures is actually very large. It's exponentially large with respect to the length of the sequence that we are talking about. So we want to find ways of how AI can help us uh, discover different structures that we can try out as potential solutions. Okay? So here, is the part on crowd intelligence based on based treatment. So this is where our human intelligence can be contributing to this process. Actually, all of you can participate in this project to try to contribute. Okay? So this project is called Folded. It's actually a game that you can play to try to help the scientists discover uh, different protein structures. Protein structures that may be able to bind to and neutralize the SARS-CoV-2 SARS spike protein to make it uh, uh, not infecting people. Okay? So this is uh, where you can, uh, you can contribute your human intelligence to help the discovery of such protein structures. So this project, uh, you, can, you can follow the link to find the project online. Basically, uh, a lot of constraints are put in place because when you try to change the folding structure of the proteins, you actually have to follow certain constraints. Certain, certain kind of folds uh, may not be uh, feasible in, in nature. Okay? So you've got to follow certain constraints. Basically, these are the activities you can carry out in this game. Okay? So the, the virus actually did display a spike protein on the surface. Your goal would be to try to tweak given proteins to try to, to try to design them into a valid structure that can, that can bind with the protein of the COVID-19 disease. If they bind it, if we can design this into a drug, we uh, administer it into the human body, it can bind with the viruses before they bind with our human cells. We can actually come up with antiviral treatment to help us combat, combat this uh, situation. Okay? So of course, there are quite complex set of uh, constraints you need to follow, which is uh, hard for 
AI to achieve alone. So your contribution would be very useful to form a basis of training data for us to uh, improve this process and try to automate it. Okay. The, there are also ongoing efforts to automate this process of discovering protein structures. Okay. In this case, I want to highlight one project. It's a very recent project. Uh, it's trying to discover secondary structure of RNAs. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, is caused by uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is an RNA, RNA virus. Okay. So this project, this project is trying to discover secondary structures on RNAs. Okay. And uh, of course, this process is also very time consuming in the labs and also very expensive if we want to do this through uh, experimental assays such as uh, x-ray refraction diffraction which is a quite uh, expensive and slow okay? so in this process uh, so in this uh, problem uh, georgia tech is a group from georgia tech is developing end-to-end uh, -end folding technology okay? So this is a deep learning based end to end uh, machine learning model, which can help us come up with the uh, various uh, valid and promising substra uh, uh, secondary structures of RNA RNAs. Okay? It is consisting of two parts. Okay? The first part is a deep neural network called deep score network. Basically it's an analyzing the ordered sequences of bases being passed into it to try to predict the uh, secondary structures. However, uh, the model alone cannot work because uh, a deep learning model alone cannot work in this situation because we have a lot of constraints on what kind of uh, structures are valid. We cannot just uh, uh, generate uh, uh, structures that appear to be useful to our objective function, but uh, there are certain constraints we need to follow. So this part is quite hard to incorporate into a deep learning model, or if we leave it for the deep learning model to discover, it's quite inefficient. So they also combine a constraint optimization post-processing step, uh, which essentially allow them to put in, the, to, to formulate the constraints into, uh, into, the, into the objective function, okay? The end-to-end -end training the, the training doesn't end at the deep neural network part. So the feedback is not directly from the neural networks, but to the other end, once the RNA secondary structures are being generated after they pass through the constraint optimization process. In this way, the end-to-end -end training can allow the network to recognize, uh, to, to actually take into account the constraints from the human knowledge that the designers has put in place that can help them evolve uh, future RNA secondary structures they can predict. Okay? So you can see uh, compared to the true structures in the experiments so far, compared to the true, true structures, the E2E4 techni technique, they can generate very similar predicted uh, secondary structures uh, with, uh, with, and the computational process is also quite efficient. Okay? So this is, uh, uh, for most cases, this algorithm, they produce structures very similar to the ground truth, which is on the left. Okay? And uh, it's also working very well for RNA sequences that are very long and difficult to predict. So this represent uh, quite a useful progress in the direction of uh, applying AI to help us uh, design antiviral treatments. Okay, so these are the projects I want to highlight to you about how AI can help us fight COVID-19. So basically in summary, there are a lot of aspects in the fight of COVID-19 that AI can help. Uh, these three aspects in the hospitals, in the economic arenas and in the labs uh, are just some of my selections. Of course, there are other areas that uh, they can be help, they can be contributing to this process. Okay? A lot of uh, very diverse AI techniques are involved, not only deep learning, but also other techniques such as optimization that can allow us to combine human knowledge into this process to assist AI to evolve with 
in, in, to come up with the useful solutions. Okay, so there are opportunities for very large organizations such as such as Alibaba and uh, WeBank, and also smaller groups such as uh, research groups in the universities or even individuals to contribute to this process. Okay, the key is to have an open mind in collaboration. Okay, so at the end, I want to point to you about upcoming talks in the Envision series. So thanks to our host. And uh, there are uh, a lot of interesting talks coming up in artificial intelligence, in blockchain, and uh, privacy and security applications. So uh, all of you are very welcome to join. Okay? Thank you very much. Hi, Prof. Uh, you are mostly welcome to share with us about such exciting uh, talk. Can you share more of us, uh, like the, uh, how is the stage of these AI applications uh, has been applied uh, in all of the COVID-19 analysts? And uh, if you can uh, share with us some of the future impact of these AI technologies, because after the COVID-19, our life will be changed. Yes. Okay, very good question. Okay. Uh, the examples I shared with you so far today, they are in various stages of deployment. Okay. Uh, for the first one, uh, the healthcare robot, a lot of, uh, they, they're pretty much done with the development for this version. Okay. They are already delivering some prototypes into hospitals so far. So that one is quite, uh, we can say that one is quite mature. Uh, other technologies I've mentioned today, uh, the uh, satellite imaging based economic indicator analysis part, uh, this one, they have built the system. They have uh, also worked on a few projects. Uh, it's close to deployment for this project and the rest are mostly uh, in the R&D stages. Okay? So I foresee going forward, uh, we, will, we, we will identify more problems that we want to find solutions with AI along the way. And uh, as, as we go forward, I will also foresee that uh, uh, AI would uh, start to play a bigger and bigger role to help us uh, to deal with this situation. Thanks, Prof. Thank you. I believe other uh, friends also have a lot of questions. Uh, please uh, feel free to raise the questions when uh, our professor is here. I see there is a question asked by someone. Uh, do you think there will be any regulations for AI? Uh, currently, there are already some regulations for AI being uh, put forth by governments, especially in the European Union and the USA. Uh, the current regulations are mostly focused on privacy protection. Okay, they want to protect the data privacy. So there are a lot of constraints on what kind of data can be shared, uh, what kind of uses business can have when they collect data. And uh, this is also one of the reasons uh, why we want to propose the concept of uh, 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 federated learning that mentioned in one of the projects. Okay. So basically, we want to help AI adapt to a new reality that uh, data cannot be easily shared. Data, can, data owned by different parties cannot be easily combined into one location to train machine learning models. As, so there's another question. Uh, what's the difference between the mentioned AI algorithm compared to other solutions? What's the pros and cons of this algorithm and what kind of uh, application best use such algorithm, okay? Uh, actually today, what we have been talking about are applications of uh, AI solutions. The kind of techniques they use in these applications, they, most of them are quite mature, okay? Uh, but uh, the, 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 main, the main development in this area so far is to try to put uh, mature solutions 
into applications that can help the situation. So this is a, uh, very helpful at the initial stage where we need to respond to the COVID-19 situation quickly. So we want to work with uh, reliable solutions. Moving forward, as we know more about the kind of challenges we are facing and know more about the characteristics of the disease, we may need to adapt certain algorithms that we put into these applications. Okay? Currently, the, uh, the applications that I mentioned today are mostly still relying on mature solutions, mature AI solutions. How is the AI can help for pension industry? Uh, this one, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, I don't really know what kind of problems the pension industry is facing. So this one, uh, I don't think I can, I can answer. Um, Prof, I have a question, right? Hey. All the technology, all the robots you mentioned, right? How soon, it seems like they are all developing in China. How soon are they going to be deployed in Singapore? Uh, this one currently, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, when it comes to deployment, a lot of considerations need to be made. Uh, the reliability of the technology need to be considered, and uh, also the uh, uh, kind of uh, the, the urgency to use the technology would also be considered to make such a decision. Okay? So in China's case, especially in Hubei's case, they're really facing a severe shortage of both manpower and protection gear. So they really have a lot of incentive, a lot of urgency to try these new technologies. A lot, uh, of course, when you, when, when you actually put the robots into hospitals, there, there will be teething problems. There will be unforeseen circumstances that we, you have to deal with. And uh, uh, for them, they are willing to try this at this stage. Uh, for Singapore's case, we are not really uh, at, that, at that level of uh, uh, demand on uh, healthcare resources so far. Okay? So for this case, uh, maybe we will still need to want to take a cautious steps uh, in terms of deploying these technologies. Okay? So maybe with the passage of time, we can learn more about the de deployment experience, the kind of lessons they have learned in Hubei with these uh, robots so that we can be better informed and we want to make such a move thank you thank you but and another point to continue with this point is that uh you know with this covid19 and the singapore economy right a lot of foreign workers may not be continue to work in singapore with all this situation right going mm -hmm. forward so i thought that singapore has a very urgency has a need to actually deploy all this automation in place so that all the workers all the all the basically like cleaners all this thing actually all those jobs uh, uh, to be, are they going to be taken up by Singaporeans? I think the answer likely no. So with the foreign workers going away, uh, uh, possibly, you know, after the COVID-19, there is an urgency for Singapore to do this uh, so-called uh, uh, transition to this automation, isn't it? So, so, so do you think that government should actually do a bit more uh, uh, push to the AI technology into all this deployment? Uh... My, my understanding would be that for the foreign workers, the kind of jobs they do would be quite diverse. Okay? Currently, the uh, kind of capabilities in those robots that we have seen are still quite limited. They may be able to replace uh, cert, uh, certain types of jobs. For example, the, exam, uh, the, the, the project we have seen in the talk, uh, tasks like uh, delivery of uh, 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 materials to the patients and uh, uh, spraying of disinfectants in certain routes, those kind of uh, very well defined tasks, they can be taken over by the robots. Uh, but I would suspect there are a lot of uh, uh, other tasks that currently we don't have a, a reliable robotic solution to really take over from the, uh, from the, from the workers. So uh, moving forward, uh, we, we, um, I would say that uh, we, we still need a lot of work in this domain. 
in order to really replace a significant chunk of the type of tasks that the foreign workers can perform. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So someone is asking, can we have access to the PowerPoint presentation by email? Uh, I think later on I can pass the PowerPoint to Vicky and uh, I think our host will find ways to uh, uh, enable everyone to download. Someone is asking about uh, uh, advices on how to use AI to find additional credit risks for financial institutions during this special pandemic period. Uh, for, for this one, it's really depending on the kind of uh, tasks that we want to perform, the kind of uh, learning tasks we want to perform with the uh, AI models. We can have uh, situations where uh, AI can help us identify uh, potential risks with uh, certain groups of borrowers like SMEs and other type of borrowers. Uh, I have seen work where uh, AI solutions are being built to identify potential fraud based on uh, the profiling of uh, uh, new customers uh, the banks can uh, encounter. And uh, in order to build models leveraging uh, data from multiple banks, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the problem actually is not technical. Okay? A lot of the times the banks, uh, they would have doubts about uh, sharing the data. Okay? Sometimes it's not the, uh, sometimes it's not about the trust in the technology, but the concerns about sharing their data would uh, weaken their competitive advantage over their competitors in the industry. Okay? So at the moment, uh, we, we still don't have a really good way to convince them to open up to the proposed, to, to the proposed uh, federated learning powered way to share data in all the areas. Okay? For them to share data in defensive problems such as identifying fraud, uh, identifying risks, this may be easier compared to other areas where uh, potentially their competitiveness can be eroded if they share data with uh, all their competitors. Someone is asking, do you think that AI can help with the human emotional needs like marriage? Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, I have seen projects where uh, uh, people are developing AI, AI based companions to provide emotional support, but not for marriage, uh, mostly for uh, aging related applications for senior citizens who are living alone. They provide companionship uh, to help them uh, to, to reduce their loneliness. Okay? They provide the basic functions such as managing their calendars, provide simple chats. Uh, sometimes they are designed into forms that uh, appear to be cute, like a small animal, uh, those kind of uh, uh, human computer interaction design concepts combined with uh, uh, AI powered companions can also be helpful in this domain. Okay. Uh, for marriage, uh, so far, I haven't seen any, <laughs> any useful work in this domain. Okay. So Karen is asking to achieve, to achieve breakthrough. What do you hope to see in terms of global efforts and government policies? So what are the specific things you hope to see happen? Well, uh, so far, uh, projects that involve healthcare professionals, they're mostly done through acquaintances. So people already know each other. Like uh, we have established collaboration with certain hospitals, which happen to uh, experience certain problems. So they feedback to us and uh, we look at the kind of solutions that we have on hand, whether we can put them together into uh, into a system that can help them. So these are mostly ground up uh, problems and solutions related to these problems. So for, for this situation, uh, I don't know whether governments can help through policies in this situation because uh, uh, 
I think in this case, it's most important for people on the ground to communicate with each other to, from different fields to, to open up to, to people from other fields so that they know uh, certain those like hospitals, like research labs, they are experiencing certain challenges and uh, AI researchers can find ways to help. Uh, so for, for this to happen, actually, I, I would feel that the, if we have a global, pro, a global platform where such information can be shared, it will be very helpful. We have seen certain similar platforms emerging. I have seen a, a platform in the University of British Columbia where, where they allow professors to post projects, to post challenges, and for the undergraduate students and the graduate students and other researchers to see. If some of them feel that they, uh, they can have a solution, they can contact these people who are posting these challenges. Uh, similar platforms uh, are also available in uh, large AI companies in China, such as uh, the uh, uh, Alibaba King platform, where they post their challenges online for multiple teams all over the world to participate, to show the solutions and try to compete with each other. And uh, this can really push the development of uh, uh, AI in certain domains. If we can, if we can help, if we can have such a collaboration, where uh, people who are in the front line of fighting against COVID nineteen, they can share their problems, um, if possible, share related data. Uh, it would be very helpful for useful solution to emerge over time. So there are several questions that are quite similar and the human race. Uh, what are your thoughts on the ethical issues faced by AI? So. Uh, I would think that uh, also AI one day will control human. I think these questions they are quite similar in nature. Okay. Uh, there, there, there are certain ethical issues that has been identified uh, when we try to adopt AI solutions. Okay. There are issues uh, such as uh, the impact on employment, whether AI is crowding out some type of worker in the economy. Uh, there are uh, concerns with regard to how AI makes choices. If such choices are not mitigated by human beings, would the uh, AI solutions really learn to make choices that follow certain ethical principles? And what kind of uh, data representation, what kind of representation can we design, you know, to represent human ethical considerations and incorporate them into AI solutions. So currently, uh, a lot of research interest in this area, uh, there's still no universal solution uh, that can account for all these different facets. Okay? And for, for each of these facets, actually, we don't really have a consistent solution so far still trying to make sense of uh, how we can express ethical considerations in a form that can be incorporated into different AI frameworks and uh, how we can explain such designs uh, as AI evolve. Okay. A, lot of this, a lot of the time once we deploy an AI solution and new data comes in that causes the model to be updated as they learn with the new data. Sometimes the designer themselves cannot really control which direction the, uh, the algorithm would evolve, so-called. And uh, would, should we still work in the current uh, framework of AI or should we design new frameworks? So these are all open research problems being considered. Okay? Uh, so ethical issues are being considered in AI research. Currently, we don't have uh, very good solutions to this, uh, but uh, the whole community is quite aware of these uh, issues. We certainly will not want 
AI to fully control human beings. But as the AI uh, becomes more ubiqu ubiquitous in the applications we use, uh, uh, there will be situation where we yield certain level of control to AI. For example, uh, when you use Grab, uh, or we, if in China it's, it's called DD, every day DD makes around 30 million transactions, or 30 million matches between uh, customers and cars. This process, we have no choice but to relinquish our control of this whole process to AI, because we, we cannot really review each of the 30 million matching and to see are we treating customers fairly? Are we treating all the drivers fairly? Are drivers being overworked? Are drivers being paid uh, in, in a fair way? So, so all these decisions are happening in real time. They're happening really, really fast. We cannot really review all of them in time. So we have to relinquish certain level of control to AI in these kind of situations. Okay? But we are trying to find solutions to still incorporate certain uh, value propositions or certain human values into this process so as so that we can still mitigate the ethical issues. Okay. Uh, hello, Professor, can you hear me? Yes. Um, uh, I'm a student from China and uh, I'm doing some research in about the uh, hardware of the uh, AI technology. So I have a question about, uh, do you think uh, the hardware and the software, which one uh, fall behind in the AI technology development? Uh, and my second question is, uh, my research is about uh, Memrister, it's about uh, new uh, AI devices in uh, uh, microchips. Uh, so how do you think about some uh, new devices uh, in AI technology? Um, are they uh, something very useful or just something fantasy um, and uh, useless? Hey, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, myself is not really a hardware person, so uh, I may not be able to answer your, your, your second question. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, AI solutions, which one is lagging hardware or software, uh, it's, quite, uh, uh, it's quite different to different types of uh, AI solutions that we are talking about. In, in, uh, some, in some cases, we have good so we have uh, good algorithms that are working in uh, that can produce solutions in real time. For example, we have a lot of uh, constraint optimization algorithms that can produce near optimal solutions in real time. So in that case, the algorithms they are very efficient. They don't they are not really constrained too much by hardware. So we can. Uh, uh, we don't need to rely on a lot of hardware in order to complete the calculation. But when you when it comes to training large deep models, or uh, when it comes to computing certain uh, certain solutions, for example, Shapley value, which is commonly used to de to derive fair solutions in in AI applications. So those country so those kind of computations we don't really have. Uh, efficient software solution yet, and we need to rely on we need to rely on parallelization or other hardware technique to speed up this process. So it's quite uh, dependent on the kind of algorithms we talk about. So it's not a uniform whether software is lacking or hardware is lacking in the landscape of AI. Thank you. is telling me we can have maybe one more question. Are there any more questions? The last one. Well, if not, thank you for joining us, everyone. So hope all of you have a good night. Stay safe and uh, we see you again. <laughs>